Good morning. I'm Pastor Mike from Park Avenue Baptist Church, and I'm so glad you've chosen to join us today. We at Park Ave want to be a help to you, so if you have a prayer request or a question about today's sermon, fill out the Connect card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for being with us, and we hope you enjoy today's service. Good morning, Park Avenue Baptist Church. Thanks for being back with us. We are in week 10 of our series in the book of Ephesians, and we want to dive right in with a little bit of review and then moving into our new content in the second half of Ephesians chapter 5. And so to review a little bit for us, first of all, our overarching theme, this idea that we want to drive home because it's the idea that Paul was driving home with uh, these believers over and over again is this idea that we have been given everything we need in Christ. Every spiritual provision has been made for us before we even realized that we needed it. And what a powerful thing that is. Um, in looking at the book of Ephesians and what Paul wrote there, we can see the first part of the book tells us who we are in Christ. It tells us about the gospel and what it has done for us and it is the bedrock of everything that comes after. Uh, the second half of the book tells us how we are to live in light of that new identity in Christ. Uh, when we try to live out these behaviors apart from our new identity, just by our own efforts, uh, that is a disastrous thing for us. Uh, last week, we looked at some areas that we we imitate God best when we choose to walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. And in particular, that idea of walking in love and what that requires of us. Uh, we used a quote from Amy Carmichael that I think summarizes this so beautifully. She said, one can give without loving, but one cannot love without giving. And so today, we want to move ahead into uh, the end of the, uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Um, this is a section loaded with potential landmines. And these tend to be the passages that make me exceedingly nervous to, to preach through. Um, so I am doing my very best to navigate with faithfulness to God's word and also sensitivity to people's hearts. I think it is possible to accomplish both, and I'm going to do my very best. Uh, we're going to start uh, by backing up just a couple verses, uh, 15, 16, and 17 were part of what we looked at last week, but they really provide some vitally important connective tissue for us as we head into the second half of the chapter. So let's dive in. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise, making the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Uh, now, uh, this is really beautiful setup for us for where we're heading next, not just this week, but really next week as well. Um, Acting thoughtlessly, that's what comes naturally for us. Uh, understanding what the Lord wants us to do and how he has resourced us to do it is our only uh, wise path around acting thoughtlessly. Uh, recognizing the opportunities that are available to us uh, and that those opportunities are not always easy to leverage because we live in evil days. And also the idea of don't live like fools, but like those who are wise and be careful how you live. So Paul is going to start digging into some very specific areas where we need to leverage this advice. So uh, verse 18, he dives right into the thick of it and says this, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Now, this is not the main thrust of uh, the passage today, but I, I want to take a little pause here 
and camp out here for just a moment because I think this is one of those areas where we can get really, really messed up. So, I want to dig into this for a few minutes. First of all, I would say this, that we need to be careful not to make God's Word say what we wish it said. Um, and we need to let God's Word say what it actually says because God knows what he's doing. Uh, and we might say, well, I would have written that differently. Well, you're not God. So I think we can trust him with what he chose to say. And we need to recognize here that this is a prohibition on drunkenness, not a prohibition on drinking. And so often, perhaps even with very good intentions, we draw a line where God didn't. Um, so I want to talk this through. Um, I guess, first of all, again, a reminder, God does not need our help. Um, if he had wanted to put the line in a different spot, if he had wanted to say, don't drink, um, he could have said that. Uh, that wasn't oversight on his part. Um, he warned us against precisely what he intended to warn us against. Um, and there are some important wisdom principles that come into play for us. Some things that we can say, uh, what are some good questions that could help me diagnose uh, the place that drinking can have in my life. And so I want to give you three and then a fourth statement uh, that just may be wise for us to consider in this area. First of all, does drinking make my relationship with God, his people, and my family better? Just a, a, something for us to consider. Secondly, uh, am I losing financial and time resources that I need to give elsewhere? Uh, I'm not saying what your answer should be. I'm just saying these are things that wisdom would say, eh, we should probably consider this. And lastly, am I at risk of getting drunk and because of that, making foolish and potentially damaging choices because I drink? Uh, because part of the nature of alcohol is that uh, your clarity of thought uh, dissipates as you get further into the activity. So uh, where you started saying, well, I'm only going to have one. Uh, after you've had one, you may decide, well, it's not going to harm me anything to have a couple more. And so we just need to acknowledge how does my personality grapple with this? Um, lastly, uh, I would say this, that I will never have to stop what I never start. Uh, for me personally, uh, drinking has never been part of my life. Uh, I'm okay with that. Um, there is some family history of abuse in that area and some messy situations that came about as a result. Um, and for me, it's never been something that I pursued. It's not something I intend to at this point because I go, wow, I could see where that could be very much a problem for me. I don't have the time to give to it. I don't have the money to give to it. Um, and I'm not sure it would bring up the best in me in terms of decision making. So for me, uh, I am going to choose to avoid drunkenness by avoiding drinking. That's my choice. That may not be yours, but I would encourage you to demonstrate wisdom in that. So, jumping back into our passage, verse 18. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, so we have a contrast here, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. So instead of doing this damaging thing, being drunk, Paul encourages these believers, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And being filled with the Holy Spirit is going to have some results there. Now, 
We could make all kinds of arguments about uh, what all of this means, what the significance of each of these things is. That's a different message. Uh, for today, uh, what I really want to drill in on is based on what is said here, if there's not a joyful response going on in your heart, it really doesn't matter what's coming off your lips. In other words, if the Holy Spirit is not at work in you, helping you to create a joyful response, even in the most difficult of times, uh, you can sing as loudly or as beautifully or as uh, with as much passion as you desire, but you're just putting on a show if the words coming off of your lips are not reflective of what God is doing in your heart. And I think we need to be careful there. Continuing, verse 20. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Two things super quick. In the space of just a couple verses, we have accounted for the work of the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. They are always working together in tandem with one another. And this admonition to give thanks for everything does not leave us a lot of wiggle room, even in the things that we don't particularly feel like being thankful for because they're uncomfortable, they're unpleasant, we don't understand why God is allowing them, but we can choose to be thankful even when we don't understand. I'm not saying that's easy, not saying that's natural, but that's why we need the gospel at work in our hearts. Uh, verse 21. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I think this is really important because Submit is one of those trouble words in this passage, but the first mention of this word submit is in reference of believers in their relationship to one another. And I think that's really important for us to take note of. Uh, in terms of implication, I would suggest this, that I need to be ready to submit to Jesus Christ as my Lord. Uh, we talk about accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And for most of us, we're all about having him be our Savior, to take care of our sin problem, to take care of the punishment that comes with being a sinner. But we're a little more reticent about having him be our Lord because we want to be in charge. And those two things go together. He is Savior and Lord. We do not get the opportunity to pick and choose there. Uh, but in addition to submitting to Christ, I also need to be ready to submit to fellow believers in honor of Christ. So because of what Christ has done for me, I will choose to submit to you. Um, so my preferences don't always have to win the day. My way of doing things doesn't always have to win the day. Sometimes I'm going to say, it doesn't have to be about me. I need to look at my fellow believers and what will be good and beneficial for them. Um, now, there are a lot of what ifs that we grapple with at this point. Um, well, what if I submit to them, but they don't submit to me? What about that? Um, and I would suggest that you do your part as unto God. And let God worry about that. You do what you're supposed to do. You defer where you can. You honor them where you can. You think of things from their perspective where you can. And let God take care of their part. Because you can't change them. Some days you can't even change you. So, uh, we're next heading into the famous verses dealing with the roles of husbands and wives. And so before we go there and uh, step into that particular powder keg, 
I want to provide some framework for us starting out. So, a couple truths for us. First of all, marriage was God's idea, and it is a good gift to humanity. We as people did not invent marriage. God did. He knew what he was doing. He was giving a good gift. Also, I believe that we can lovingly refuse to compromise on a historic Christian view of marriage, and we need to. Um, our culture is doing a lot to try to redefine what marriage means. And um, I don't think we need to be ugly about it, but I do think we need to stand our ground in terms of God created this. He created it as a good gift, and we should not be messing with the recipe. And that's just an important thing for us to keep in mind. Uh, a two quick quotes that I wanted to share, uh, one from Tony Medina, he said, Christ, not marriage, is ultimate. Our primary loyalty must be to Jesus. And that's really important for us to keep our eyes on. And then author Gary Thomas, uh, his book, Sacred Marriage, this is the, the subtitle for that book. And he says, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? I think those are important things for us to consider. Um, so that brings us to verse 22, where preachers fear to tread, and here we go. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, and Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Yikes. Okay, here we go. Some things I want to make sure we address. First of all, submission is not indicative of value. It is indicative of function. So, there is nothing in these verses that indicates that women are less valuable than men. That they are less capable of making decisions than men. It does say that God designed things to function in a certain way. Now, in that, I want to stick with the analogy that's used here of the body and the head. And... A head does get input from its body. It needs information that the body is sending it as a brain makes decisions. In the same way, a, a wise husband will recognize that his wife has valuable insights and perspectives. And he will want to hear from her. He will want to include her in decision making because she brings a great deal of value and a man is foolish when he chooses to just ignore that. Um, so, let me pull some implications out here for us. First of all, uh, for all of us, I need to be ready to submit to Jesus Christ as my Lord. And if you are a wife, you also need to be ready to submit to your loving husband in honor of Christ. So all of us called to submit to Christ. If you're a wife, you're called to submit to your husband, not because your husband is always right, but because of Christ and because Christ set this forth as a model. Secondly, I want to say this, if you're really bothered by the idea of submitting, don't become a wife. And actually, if you're really bothered by the idea of submitting, don't become a Christ follower either. Because both of those roles require submission. And God is not being mean or trying to uh, press you down and degrade you in any way. He wants you to flourish, and this is his design. So, 
A wife's willing submission to a loving husband is intended to be a vivid picture of the church's submission to Jesus Christ. Now, there's a phrase that is used there. Uh, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Um, and ladies, that does not mean that you turn your brain off and just do whatever he says, no matter what. The original language here really indicates not so much the idea of in everything, but in, in all of your being. Like your submission is not just a physical thing. It's not just a mental thing. It's, it's, it's an emotional and spiritual thing. It's pervasive of your entire being. It's not segmented. And that's, I think, important for us to understand that uh, the call on wives to submit is not an excuse for men to be bullies, for them to degrade their wives, for them to disregard their thoughts, their observations. Uh, it is not a reason to stay in a situation that is abusive, and it is not a reason that uh, a a wife enters into sin on her husband say so because the authority of God supersedes the authority that God has granted her husband we move from there into the verses centered on husbands uh, verse 25 for husbands this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church so, in that same way, a husband's sacrificial love for his wife is intended to be a vivid picture of Christ's abundant provision for the needs of his church. So, this is not first and foremost about who gets to make the demands and who gets to obey them. This is a picture of how is the church obedient to Christ. So there is a much more vivid spiritual picture here in play. So moving from there, uh, Paul outlines for us a little more about what is Christ like as he does his work and how far did his love go? And so we have the original Instruction to husbands. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. That is costly love right there. So, uh, Christ redeemed his church and set an impossibly high bar for what real love looks like. Uh, husbands, we're never going to strive to love our wives as Christ loved the church and go, huh, I just lapped him. I just passed Jesus. Um, I'm loving my wife better than Christ loved the church. That's not going to happen. Um, but guys, we love a challenge. And this is a challenge for us. To love to the best of our ability. So, husbands do not redeem their wives. That was a description of what, how Christ functions. However, they are responsible to provide spiritual leadership in the home. So my encouragement, <coughs> excuse me, my encouragement to husbands would be don't demand respect. Don't say, woman, you're supposed to submit. Earn her respect 
by being someone she can respect. Be a man of character. Be a man of integrity. Be a man of compassion. And when you become that kind of man, she is not going to have an issue submitting to you. Because you're going to be the kind of husband that she needs. So continue in verse 28. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. We are good at taking care of ourselves. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. We know that to be true. That if we're tending that relationship and making sure that our wife feels loved, um, our home is, a, is a, a more positive, a more peaceful place. But if we are at war, if we are in conflict, if we are trying to impose authority over her and she is resisting that, the home becomes a war zone. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So right there, he makes a statement that marriage is intended to help illustrate a spiritual truth. But because it involves uh, fallible, sinful humans, it's a marred picture. It's an imperfect representation. Verse 33 summarizes some of the main points he's been talking about here. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. It's interesting here because um, those who study marriage dynamics would say, what is the thing that a wife desires most? Well, she wants to be loved, she wants to be treasured, she wants to be valued, she wants to be pursued, um, she wants to be protected, she wants to be loved by her husband. What does a husband want most of all from his wife? He wants to be respected. He wants to know that while he doesn't always get it right, he doesn't know it all, that she looks to him to help provide leadership. So well, let me unpack some implications for us as we wrap things up. First, a man's genuine love creates a climate conducive to a wife's submission. Make sense? Uh, a husband who loves well makes it easier for a wife to submit. Secondly, a wife's willing submission creates a climate conducive to a husband's love. One impacts the other positively. So where does it start? Well, it starts with you, whoever you are. And that means if you are a husband or a wife, you need to do the part that is assigned to you. If you are a, a friend to a husband or to a wife, what is your job? To encourage them, even when it's difficult, to be loving, to be submissive, to show respect, to honor her. Now, there are all kinds of what ifs. Well, what if I'm doing my part, but he's not doing his part? What if I'm doing my part, but she's not doing her part? What if he is very unloving? What if she is very rebellious? And I would say, just like with believers, you do your part and let God deal with them. Um, you don't get to, well, I'll obey my part when they obey their part. No, you start obeying. Um, we also get ourselves into a big heap of trouble when we start off a marriage on the wrong foot. So, um, appearance, income, temperament can all be factors in finding a mate. We can go, oh, they look good. I want them. Or, ooh, 
He makes a lot of money. Or, we get along so well, we have fun together. And all of those things have their place. But nothing is more vital than, do I love God the way I should? And do they love God the way they should? If two people are committed to obeying God and to becoming closer and closer to Him, as they get closer to God, they will get closer to one another. And they are going to be in alignment on a lot of priorities. Uh, when we choose foolishly, we face a lifetime of difficult results. In many cases, not all, but in many cases, he was not a loving husband from the beginning. He was not loving when you were dating. Um, he was suave. He was impressive. He was strong. He was bold. And you said, that'll be enough. Uh, and for wives, uh, uh, you may have looked to her and gone, oh, she's so beautiful. The other guys are jealous. Um, uh, I want to marry her. And you didn't look at her character and what her life priorities were. Uh, the good news is that God loves to redeem. God loves to rescue. Uh, sometimes it takes longer than we would like, but it is his desire. So, human marriage gives us an imperfect picture of what the relationship between Christ and his church is like. So we can learn some things by looking at marriage, about Christ and the church, but marriage is made up of imperfect people, so as a result, the picture is imperfect. The relationship between Christ and his church gives us a perfect picture of what human marriage should be like. Now, it's not going to work quite the same because no husband is perfect, and Christ is. And then lastly, the often painful imperfections in human marriage should not be allowed to confuse or corrupt the picture we've been given of what God is like, of what Jesus Christ is like, and what their relationship with the church is like. So, you may come from a family, you may look at the example of your parents and go, their relationship was so messed up. You may be in the midst of a marriage right now that you're like, we have so many issues. Or you may be someone who has said, I'm never getting married because of what I have observed. And you have a very negative impression of marriage. And I would just encourage you to allow your opinion of people to be one thing and your opinion of God to be wholly distinct from that. Because they do not represent him. Not fully, not perfectly. And so we can have a confidence in God that far surpasses our human loyalties. Uh, wives, I hope that you are able to look to your husband and say, I have a good man. He loves God. He's not perfect. He messes up. But he helps remind me of what real love looks like. And I hope that as ladies, as you model loving submission, that it can be a challenge for all believers that this is how we are to respond to Christ. That's everything I wanted to talk about from this passage today. There's so much more here. But as we look at this area of husbands and wives and how they relate, I just want to remind us once again that we have been given everything we need in Christ. 
the, the resources that are most valuable to you in your marriage are spiritual resources. Because you are an eternal soul relating with another eternal soul. And you are both in need of gospel transformation. So invite God in to do that work. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are at work in the messiest of situations. And, and God, I don't want to oversimplify any of the pain that people may have experienced or may be experiencing right now. But God, I would just ask that you would allow us to see that you are good and that you are at work even in the situations that are most painful for us. God, would you help us to lean into you and not into our own, own understanding? Our wisdom is flawed. Your wisdom is wholly reliable. We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week.